Hey everybody, welcome back to episode five. Now this is gonna be a series circuit discussion. A series circuit discussion that you never really thought you needed to know, but it's gonna change the way that you look at these circuits. Now I'm not gonna go in depth in this discussion about how series circuits work. That's probably a little different direction than what I'm gonna be taking through most of these videos because uh, you can find plenty of resources out there about the way series circuits work. Plus, you don't want to hear me give a whole bunch of formulas and calculations about things that you can already look up and are found thousands of places in every textbook and online. But they always present series circuits the exact same way. Now, if you've been through a course or looked at textbooks or really any book online manuals about electronics, the series circuit is the very first time where they start putting multiple components together into a circuit in something more than just like a light switch that's just on and off. The basic one is called series circuit and series, uh, the way we think about series means one right after another, like a series of movies, a TV show is a series. It means that one follows another rather than all things happening at the same time. I mean, if it's a TV series, they don't release all the episodes at the same time. You have episode one and then two and then three, kind of like this sequence right here. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to dive into the last one first. You want to go through them progressively one at a time. And that's the way we think about series as far as series circuits. Each component in the circuit follows another component. The way I think about it, uh, when, we, when you think about electricity, it's kind of like water flow in pipes. I've mentioned that analogy before, uh, and it still holds true here. Uh, but when we think about a series circuit, it's kind of like a pipe with a whole bunch of different valves and things happening inside this pipe. Uh, there might be things where a T and it splits off, but if we continue looking at one single pipe and we see lots of things happening in that one single pipe, that would indicate a series of things that the water has to flow through in order to get the job done. Now, this is exactly the same thing in a series circuit as well. There's one main line for all of the current to travel through and all the current has to go through each device one right after another. Now, typically, the way this is presented as a series circuit is by looking at two load devices, usually represented as resistors, one right after another. Now, I'm going to go to the whiteboard here just a little bit. I'm not going to rely on it too much, but just enough that uh, if you've seen these kind of things before, I wanted to start kind of making a little bit of a connection to you. So some of you say, oh, okay, yeah, I have, I have sort of seen that before, at least somewhere. Even if it's been a while, it should start kind of triggering some things if you've, if you've seen any basic electronics before. So let's look at the way that a typical textbook or website would represent a series circuit. The first thing that we'd have is a power supply. Now, just for simplicity's sake, we'll just consider a standard DC power supply. And we run through a wire. And then we hit this first, that squiggly line component. That's what they call a resistor. And really in electronics, it just refers to any component that changes the electricity into some other form. Remember we were talking about load devices? We said that was basically the job. It was to convert the electrical energy into something else. Well, that's the job of the resistor, and that's why they represent that as the load device. Now, most of the time, it's kind of abstract. Here, I'll show you what that would look like as a series, one followed by another one, so there's two of them. Now, they usually don't put a label to it. They don't say, oh, by the way, this represents a light and this one's a motor. They just leave it very generic to say, it can be anything. Any load device is an appropriate use of a resistor symbol. Some of them are a little more complicated than that, but for the most part, that's how we can represent them and it works just fine. The problem is it starts to get a little bit abstract if we don't actually connect it to a legitimate component. So instead of looking at it as a, uh, as a sequence of uh, of just resistors, let's rewrite these and look at how in a real life circuit, this kind of circuit would actually play in. Now we'll talk about this one only a little bit because honestly, in real life circuits, you don't see series resistors, series load devices all that much. Now a lot of small scale components, like you know, you look at a printed circuit board and it's got just capacitors and resistors all over the place on it. There's quite likely a lot of series circuits going on there. But on most of our things that we're gonna be troubleshooting and learning about and actually seeing and having to fix and troubleshoot, those kind of things honestly are very rarely series load devices, series resistors. And let's see why. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase these and then rewrite them as more, um, I don't want us to use the word legitimate components because there's nothing illegitimate about a resistor, um, but something a little bit less abstract. Something that actually represents a thing that you can pick up and see and go, oh, I know what this does, like a light bulb. There's no question about what a light bulb does. But if you pick up a resistor and you hold it and somebody says, well, what does this resistor do? 
you know, like I've got some examples of resistors here. What does this resistor do? And I guess the best you can say is it resists electricity. I mean, it's not wrong, but this component is really just designed to make the electricity do what we want so that the load device works properly. Well, if we build a circuit that doesn't really have a load device in it, it sounds like we've kind of created something that's very difficult to, to really understand. So instead, we're going to rewrite these as actual components. So I mentioned a light and a motor. Let's go ahead and use a light and a motor. So I'll just use one as a light bulb, typical symbol for a light bulb. Different schematics, you'll see them all sorts of different ways, so don't get too picky about, well, that's not the light bulb I've seen in a schematic before. I know, there's a lot of different kinds. Uh, and then for motor, that's usually a symbol that we give, something like this. It's supposed to represent the rotor and then the armatures and uh, the magnets around it. Don't worry too much about the, the exact syntax. In fact, later on when we talk more, we're going to focus more on industrial stuff as we get further into this series. And at that point, pretty much everything is just going to turn into circles. A circle with a label inside of it. A light bulb, it's going to be a circle with a color inside of it. A motor, that's going to be a circle with either a motor starter, because actually we don't use those to run the motors. We use them to run the motor starting devices. And they'll all just be a circle. So don't get too attached to these symbols right here. I'm just putting them up on the whiteboard for the sake of just seeing them. So let's pretend that this is an incandescent light and a motor. Now, an incandescent light and a motor are both going to have very low resistances. Usually no more than just a few ohms, but that kind of depends on the amount of power output that it's supposed to have. Lower power output means a higher resistance because it restricts the flow of electricity more. But let's, uh, let's just throw a couple of numbers in here just to make the math easy. Let's just say this is 10 and this is 10. Now, ohms, 10 ohms is a value of resistance. 10 ohms means that's how much it restricts the flow of electricity. And here again is one where we say, well, what is an ohm? How much does that actually affect electricity? That's kind of a difficult term to say because it's all that the resistance only relates the current flow through the circuit to how much voltage was applied to the circuit by looking at the amount of resistance. If we just said, how much resistance is that? I mean, how much resistance is 10? That's a really difficult concept to, to explain. Now, if I said, how much voltage is 9 volts? It'd be a little easier because you could hold up a 9-volt battery and say, it's this much. Now, you can't see voltage and you can't see current, but at least you can hold a 9-volt battery and say, okay, I guess that kind of gives me a physical idea of where I could find 9 volts. A uh, car battery is 12 volts. So we could say, oh, that a car battery, 12 volts. So now I kind of have an idea of what that looks like. Current is also fairly easy. Because in different types of devices, we could say how much current is going through it. Like, uh, let's say that you plug something into the wall, like a, a griddle, and it's a 1,200-watt griddle. Uh, that's a, not an uncommon power output, like 1,000 or 1,200 watts. Heaters, same thing. Yeah, like your 750 and then 1,500, like with a selector switch for high and low. So if we have 1,200 watts of power in a normal household outlet, that's 10 amps of current. The, the mathematical relationship, like I said, you can find everywhere online. Ohm's law, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but it will pop up from time to time because we can't just ignore it. But that can, kind of gives us an idea of what, what does 10 amps look like? What does it feel like? Oh, okay, a griddle. Uh, one of your electric griddles that sits on the stovetop. Okay, that's about a 10 amp device. But as soon as it turns into resistance, there really isn't something where we can say, okay, now I know what, now I see a device that know, I know what resistance feels like. I know what, what component leads to this much resistance. That one's a little harder. So instead, what we want to think about is resistance is the thing that causes a restriction in the flow of electricity. So if I have this many volts in my circuit and I see that this many amps are being allowed through, the resistance is the number that relates those two things together. It's kind of like a factor, in, in math they call that a constant or a factor of relationship between an input and an output. In fact, the, um, the formula V equals I times R, which is the, the Ohm's law formula, that, that, the way that's phrased, V equals I times R, well if we turn around that I and R, it says V equals R times I, and if you're familiar with algebra, remember back to it, that sounds a lot like that formula, Y equals MX plus B, that linear equation, and if we forget the B part of it, which is the, the Y-intercept, it, I'm not going to go into that too much right here, but uh, if we forget about that part of it, that Y equals MX, 
and V equals RI, if we just kind of rearrange the letters, that sounds like those two formulas are pretty similar. It means that there's a linear relationship between the amount of resistance and the amount of current being allowed through the circuit. So if we double the amount of resistance, we cut the current exactly in half. It's called a linear relationship if it follows the form of that Y equals MX from that old y-intercept form of the equation of a line, which V equals RI, which is just rearranging V equals IR, the normal way people say it. And if that's all that it is, then that means it's a linear relationship between those two. If you do something to one of those pieces, like the resistance, you will do exactly the opposite effect to the current. Double the resistance, cut the current in half. If you triple the resistance, you'll cut the current by three times. So it's a factor of relationship between the amount of voltage and the amount of current. So taking a look at this circuit, here we've got an equal amount of resistance between these two devices. Now a light bulb stays a fairly constant resistance. It changes a slight amount while it's running, but very slightly. Not really a whole lot at all. Now motors, depending on how we run a motor, that has a a very drastic amount of effect on how the circuit runs. So this is a very common, uh, more of a real life example of how a series circuit would appear in real life. So the light bulb is a constant resistance, but the motor could be a varying resistance. Now motors are a little bit tricky to think about because a motor is a form of an electromagnet, no matter whether it's a single phase DC or three phase motor from the tiny little hobby ones that run on three volts to the huge 100 horsepower motors, they all run on a concept of creating an electromagnetic field which causes either a permanent magnet or another set of electromagnets to be attracted or repelled from a magnetic field that is changing. Now a DC motor, you plug in a plus and a minus voltage and it contacts the part of the motor that rotates, called the rotor. And as it spins, it has these two little spring-loaded contacts that make the electricity flow through the center and create an electromagnet. But we don't want the north and south poles, the outside and then the spinning inside, to hit north and south and click, just come into place. It would just hold right there. Instead, right before north and south line up, let's switch the polarity of this thing so that now north and south want to repel and it keeps spinning around in a circle faster and faster. So inside, it's constantly rotating, and that rotating effect creates more resistance. The faster it rotates, the more resistance that we have. So in this real life example, the time when we would see the most current going through this circuit is when the motor is spinning the slowest. Now that seems kind of odd because you think as a motor spinning faster, it's doing more work, right? But actually that's not true because what is it that causes a motor to spin faster? It's to take the load off of it. If we load down a motor, we put something on it, or even some of these tiny motors, you can just touch it with your finger and it comes to a stop. If it comes completely to a stop, then there's actually a lot of current going through that motor. The faster it goes, the more electromagnetic, back, they call it back electromotive force, back EMF is a term that you'll hear. The more of that that we have, the faster, the, the, the more, the faster it goes, the more resistance that we're going to see. So what we would see here is a light bulb and a motor, and if the motor is allowed to spin extremely fast, then there's going to be a significantly higher amount of resistance. Now the resistance then would no longer be 10, the resistance would be higher. Now as the resistance goes up, what did we say was going to happen to the current? As resistance goes up, current goes down. So there's less electricity flowing through this circuit. What would you expect to see with a light bulb then? You'd expect to see the light bulb a little bit dimmer. Now if we put a load on the motor, what's going to happen to the motor? Remember, so we stick a if it's driving a belt or a chain or something, we engage that belt, and now all of a sudden the motor bogs down. Most of the time with big motors, you can even hear them and feel them sometimes just bogging down. And as soon as that happens, it's going to slow way down. And what happens to the resistance? It decreases. Now, an interesting effect about the decrease of the resistance, decrease of resistance also means it's going to consume more electricity. Now, when do motors use the most electricity? Motors use the most electricity when they are trying to either start up or when they've been bogged down so much they just lock, they stall. Motor stall current is much higher and the startup current is much higher because it's going the slowest. The faster the motor gets going, the more resistance it has. So as soon as I put a load on that motor and engage the belt or the pulley or whatever it is, then the, res the speed is going to decrease. 
Therefore, the resistance decreases and the amount of current going through that circuit increases. So the slower the motor goes, the brighter the light is going to be because there's more electricity flowing through the circuit. Now, the light never changed. So if we were looking at that from an outside perspective, we'd say, well, it looks like the light's changing. Because every time I do something, the light gets brighter and gets dimmer. But the thing that is actually doing the changing is the motor. The motor, or really any other device in the circuit, a light or a constant resistor is the one piece that we can guarantee to remain steady. It must be the other thing that by, inf by causing some change on the other component, we can see the effects of the rest of the component. And it's a pretty interesting phenomenon with motors. Now, if something is using up more energy, we could probably pretty accurately say that more electricity is going through the circuit. So if something requires a ton of energy to get moving, we would probably be safe in assuming that there's more energy going through the circuit at that time. So that's why big motors can't be run with small voltage sources, because it simply needs a whole lot more energy in order to get going, especially once it gets up to speed, then it's okay to slow down a little bit, or, or instead of accelerating, which requires more energy, it's just holding at a constant velocity, and therefore it doesn't require quite as much electricity. So the time when we would see absolutely the most electricity going through this circuit is two times. One is as it just begins to get going, and the other one is after it gets going, assuming this isn't a very strong motor. Don't do this if you've got like a fan or something attached to it or if it's going really fast or sharp blades or something, but if it's one of those little tiny hobby motors and it's got just a little disc attached to it or something, grab it and hold on to it. Don't do it for very long because it's not great for the motor. They call it stall current and locked rotor current for a reason. It's not good for the motor and it can cause it to burn up. But if you just do it for a quick second on a little motor, it should be all right. You'd see all of a sudden that light bulb would get really bright as you held it because that's when the resistance is the lowest and the current going through the circuit is the highest because it wants to get going again. So it's kind of like an automatic sort of feedback. It needs more energy to get going, but since it's an electromagnet going slower, it allows more current through, giving it that extra boost to get started so that once it gets up to speed, it doesn't need as much electricity. And since it's going faster, the resistance increases and therefore it pulls less electricity. So it's a very interesting thing when we look at series circuits in a more realistic sense, the, the difference between the two amounts of resistance in this circuit determine how much electricity is going to be flowing through the circuit. Now, in the beginning, they were both the same amount of resistance. And if they're the same resistance, the source voltage is going to be split up between the two components. The one with a bigger resistance is going to get a bigger voltage. So let's just say this was a 24 volt circuit. I would see 12 volts on each of the two equal load devices. But as that motor is now changing its resistance, we would see that as the resistance goes up, it would get more of the voltage, the light would get less of the voltage. We only have a certain amount to spit into the circuit in the first place, so it has to be split up between the load devices. Now the reason why this is not useful in industry a whole lot is because right here we kind of made a gamble. We said, well, right here we had a light bulb and a motor, and we sent in 24 volts and each one of them got 12 volts. So I'll assume that the light that I need is a 12 volt light and the motor should be a 12 volt motor. Now, if these happen to be 24 volt devices where the light needs 24 and the motor needs 24, no problem. I just plug in a 48 volt power supply because they'll both be equal. The only problem is as the motor starts and stops or the load on the motor changes, maybe you had driving a conveyor belt and you put another heavy box on the conveyor belt and it slows down a little bit, slows down. That means its resistance goes down. That means it gets less voltage, which means that the light gets more voltage, could burn up the light. Every time we make some little change in the circuit, it completely throws off that relationship between the two load series resistors. Now, another thing that could happen here is, let's say that this was a, an incandescent light with a low resistance. And one day you decide, well, let's switch it out with an LED because they're a little more energy efficient, which is true. A lot less current goes through the circuit. Why would less current go through a circuit? Well, remember that resistance current relationship? If the current goes way down to stay more energy efficient, that tells you that the resistance must be much higher. So one day you just decide, well, to make the, my process more efficient, I'm gonna take out that incandescent bulb, just unscrew the incandescent light, grab an LED and screw it back in. That should save us a whole lot of energy, right? But the resistance became much higher. So let's say now, instead of it being 10 and 10, let's say it was 110. 
Now this is no longer each one getting 12 volts anymore, or half of whatever the source is. Now this one is going to get 10 times more voltage than this one is, simply because you decided to change the type of light. That seems so inconsistent and so asking for some sort of problem that we want to be really careful to avoid that in industrial circumstances. And when I said it was kind of a gamble, what I meant is it's kind of a gamble that the exact components that you choose in every single circuit match exact ratios of resistors. And boy, if we replace it with one that's just a slight different resistance, our whole operation is going to be abnormal. That's a gamble that you really don't want to be taking when you need things to work accurately. Now these can be, these series circuits can be extremely useful with smaller scale circuits because a lot of times we want to have control over that one, like maybe it's a sensor or a knob, those potentiometers is what they call them, like a speed control or a volume control, where the whole point is to change one of the resistors to change the amount of electricity flowing through the circuit so that one of them gets more voltage than the other one. Maybe if this resistor is able to change so much that it, so one day it might be more voltage than the other one. Sometimes it might be less voltage than the other one. It gives us an ability to actually change what our circuit is doing. In the case of an input into the system, that's great. We want to be able to change stuff. But in a load device, we don't want some tiny little thing to be affecting our entire circuit. So let's change this whole discussion around. And when I said that this was going to be a little bit of an odd Sear, an odd discussion on series circuits, this is where it starts to kind of turn here. So far, this looks like a typical textbook example of a series circuit. We just stuck some actual devices in here. But let's look, rearrange this so that now we just have one load device. <clears throat> this one load device, I'll go ahead and erase the top line up here too. So let's just choose one load device. Uh, let's just stick with the light bulb. just because I hate using this, the resistor symbol. I mean, it's almost like it's, it's too easy and too abstract. Let's actually use a light bulb because it is a resistor. Now, in the case of industry, we still use the term series circuit, but we do not want to plug loads into series because then we can get in trouble if one little thing is changed just a little bit, it throws off our entire system, not good. But when we have a series control devices, Remember in the video when we talked about control devices like push buttons, sensors, things like that? That's what we mean in industry when we talk about series circuits. So depending on your context, you want to make sure that the situation that you're given accurately describes whether the series circuit is a series of inputs or a series of outputs. Now these devices as buttons, these are inputs. Loads are output devices. So series inputs or controls versus series outputs or loads. Now in the case of control devices, those also will form, th their purpose is to stop or allow electricity to flow. It's kind of what the load devices did. The, the resistance in them allowed more or less electricity to flow. So kind of the same idea, except that a control device like these either is no resistance at all, or it's an unlimited resistance, an infinite resistance. So if we have no resistance, tons of current should flow. Or, on the other hand, if we have a nearly infinite resistance, absolutely no current should flow. Those are the two situations for control devices. There are some variations on that, like we might have analog control devices. Analog is a form of getting information that varies, kind of like I was talking about the speed control or volume control knob. That's a, that's a little bit different circumstance. We don't use those to directly drive things. When we're directly driving a load device, this is what we need to worry about, the on-off type of controls. Now, if we have something like this, where two of these light switches are in series with each other, we're going to run into those all the time. Do you have any three-way switches in your house? A three-way switch is where electricity is going through one switch, and then it kind of splits off into two wires going to the other switch, and then continues off to the load. The reason it splits into two wires like that is so that when they're in opposite states, Electricity is being sent through a dead end through this wire but it is, and a dead end through the other wire. But if either one of those switches change, now the electricity can flow. So if you switch this switch down, now the electricity flows this way. But if they're in opposite states and you switch this one up, now electricity can flow this way off to the load. So no matter which of those switches, we'll either turn it off or turn it on. Now since the electricity has to go through one of them, then go through the other one on its way to the load, that's a series circuit. 
but not a series load, it's a series control. We don't ever have series, con series load devices in your house. Every light bulb, every outlet, those are all a configuration they call parallel. And that's just fine in industry. Parallel is great. We'll talk about that in the next episode. But as far as series goes, the reason we would not want those in series is because the more of these light bulbs that you stick in series is going to limit the flow of electricity even more, even more, even more, even more. So two things would happen. First one is if the light bulb goes out in series, all of them go out in that entire circuit. And the more light bulbs we plug in, the brighter and dimmer things are gonna get. So if you decide to switch one of those light bulbs out with an LED, just one of them, take out your incandescent, put an LED in its place, resistance goes way up, less current goes to the circuit, all the other light bulbs will shut off. And only the LED one will work. And we don't want that. Instead, we wanna be able to put them all in so that I can replace one of them today and then another one tomorrow. Or if this one burns out, I just need to go get a new light bulb and fix it. It doesn't burn out the entire rest of that light circuit always in parallel, but we'll, we'll cover more on that. The series controls lead us to two types of operations. There's either normally open or there's normally closed, and they can be all mixed and matched. Now, if there's two normally open circuits, I would see that from the first one, that's where my dead end occurs. No electricity can even make it to the second switch, so I can press the second switch all I want. Nothing's going to happen because no electricity even made it there. Or, on the other hand, if I leave the second switch open and start trying to press this button over and over, also nothing is going to happen. Because the electricity may make it through that one, but it's going to dead end when it hits the second one. So no matter which of those is blocking the flow of electricity, if even one of them is blocking the flow at all, no electricity is going to light up that light bulb. The only way to get this light bulb to turn on is to press both buttons. Or as we would say that in logic, we would say press this button and this button to get the load to activate. We call that an AND circuit. In logic descriptions, we use AND and OR quite frequently when we're trying to describe what happens because our brains work logically. So they design logical circuits to be able to have kind of the same notation. It means that if I press this one and this one, it will turn on. Now, it, these are called normally open. And in electronics, if you're not familiar with the terminology, open means electricity does not flow. Closed means electricity does flow. That's a tough one for the, the water analogy because when we think about valves, we say, what's an open valve? Well, you've opened the valve so the water goes through. What's a closed valve? Well, you close it and so the electricity stops. Not the same. In water, that's true, but in electricity, Closed means the two contacts have touched and electricity can flow. So closed means the electricity is going. Open means the electricity has hit a dead end and is not flowing. So important clarification there. I'm going to be using the terms open and closed an awful lot. And when I say them with a circuit, open means no electricity flows. Closed means as much electricity as can go through the circuit is going to flow. Closed, flow. Open, nothing. So if I switch out one of these with what we call a normally closed button, then that means electricity can flow until I press the button. Normally open, only when I press the button is when electricity flows. Closed means only if I don't press the button is when electricity flows. So that's uh, when we use normally open versus normally closed, we can build these circuits where you say, I need you to press this one and this one to get the light bulb to turn on. Sometimes if these were both normally closed, then we'd say, hey, this light bulb is going to run as long as you don't press this one or this one. So as long as you do not press this button and you do not press this button, the light bulb would turn on. That's what we would say if we had two normally closed switches in series with each other. Now, most of the time, you're likely to see normally closed series when we're dealing with emergency stop situations. If you have emergency stop buttons, they are all going to be normally closed in series with each other. So if these were normally closed, let me go ahead and redraw them as normally closed here. The switch symbol for that looks awfully similar, except the lines are underneath and touching the circles. Two normally closed switches. So as long as I don't press them, the light's going to be on or my machine is running. No matter which of these buttons I press, if I press down on the button, the contacts will open and electricity will stop. That's an emergency stop. You press the button, electricity stops. 
these stop buttons will always be normally closed, and if there's more than one, they will be normally closed in series with each other. If I want to have a, multiple things that an operator has to do to start a machine, uh, for a lot of safety reasons sometimes, they have you have to be like standing in a certain place and have both hands on buttons in order to get the motor to start. Otherwise, you know, you could you could accidentally, while you're reaching inside to, to take care of something, clear out a jam on a machine or something, and all of a sudden your hand slips and hits the go button, takes your hand off. So for safety reasons, they actually call it a dead man switch, kind of morbid, but gets the point across, I guess. You have to be have both hands on a very specific set of inputs in order to get electricity to flow. So that's what we call normally open. This one and this one, and maybe even the pressure plate that you have to stand on, so you have to be standing in the right place. Pressure plate and this button and this button all have to be on in order to get the load to turn on. So we call that an and, and just from the way that's said, I know that that's going to be normally open in series. So series is really common when we use that word and because it tells us that lots of things have to be happening in a row in order for the electricity to make its, all, make its way to the load. Series circuits and parallel circuits certainly aren't the only kinds of circuits either, but almost everything else is a, a combination of those two. Series is the easiest, so that's the one that we start with. There's series load devices, where the size of the resistances of the loads determine not only how much current is flowing through the circuit, but how much of the voltage each of those devices gets. The more resistance you have in a device, the more of the share of the power it's going to get, the more share of the voltage that it's going to get in the circuit. Series control devices, whether they're normally open or normally closed, the job is to either allow electricity or block electricity for either safety situations or just day-to-day -day operations. In the next video, we're going to talk about parallel circuits, in which case we're, we're going to be able to allow those in either industrial or small-scale circuits. We're not going to have to make the clarification between the two. The operation is the same. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Definitely stay tuned for more. There's a lot more good ones coming up. Uh, we've just begun to scratch the surface with different circuit configurations, and after we get through series and parallel, then we can start looking at more of the actual components that go into both controlling and loading up the circuits and see how their behavior affects the operation of the circuit. So stay tuned. I hope you had a great time, and go build something cool.